All right, everybody, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for joining me today, and thank you, Vered uh, and Jotome, that hosting me on this uh, community. Uh, I, I always think that it's not trivial that people take the time and join this kind of webinars and talks, uh, and I, I'm doing it a lot, and I'm happy that you're with me here today. I'm Ran, and I'm going to talk to you today about uh, encryption in BigQuery. We are going to discuss important principle of data pipeline protection, and we will see how uh, BigQuery provides us uh, out of the box tools that uh, allow us to perform such tasks. Now, it's important to note, I know that some of the people here doesn't use BigQuery or use other data warehouse solution. In my opinion, you still may be, uh, benefit from this talk as you might get ideas about how to implement such principle in your own data platform. So stay with me and like, I believe it will be valuable for you. Uh, so before we start, I would like to introduce myself. I've been coding since I was very young and I'm really passionate about technology, but I even more interesting about how places without technology um, live today. And on, although I'm going to talk to you about bits and bytes and number, uh, numbers, I, uh, generally try to be connected to my inner child and follow the philosophy of the little prince. And throughout my career, I worked solely with startup, two of which I founded myself. One of them was in the field of chronic pain management and the second one was on the field of, uh, um, on the field of uh, farming management. And for the last two years, I've been working as a contractor and offer CTO as a service for every stage startups and data engineering service. I help companies to set up the data uh, architecture, to build the data pipeline, design the uh, data warehouse, and generally deal with any uh, data or data analytics problem. So after you, now that you know me, we can actually start. Um, and let's, let's talk about data pipelines. If you ever built a data pipeline, it was probably looks as follow. You have an application. And this application gets requests in REST API, does some processing, and then writes the data into your data warehouse solution. All of you are seeing that screen? Or you are able to see my... Uh... So all the rest, can you see my screen? Yes, application to BigQuery. All right, so I'm not sure what is the, the issue. Uh, all right, so let's continue. So if you ever built a data pipeline, it was probably looks as follow. Uh, you have an application. This application gets request in REST API, does some processing, and then loads the data into your data warehouse solution. It might be BigQuery or Snowflake or maybe Redshift, or you might want to choose any other data warehouse solution. And in other cases, uh, you might want to write the data first into some, some uh, storage service, such as GCS or maybe S3, and only then loads it into BigQuery. And in reality, and this is more similar to the data pipeline that uh, I had in the place that I tried to solve the following problem of the following security problem, uh, you probably have more complex data pipeline where you first write the data into PubSub and only and then some data PubSub or Kafka or any other message broker and then some big data process such as uh, Dataflow or maybe Spark processes the data and only then loads it into GCS or to BigQuery. But no matter how, to how you decide to build your data pipeline, in the end, you um, have a file in your sterile service that looks like this. In this case, uh, it's a JSON file, but it might be a parquet or maybe Avro file. And in your data warehouse, you have a table that looks similar to the following example. You have the user table, which had uh, two uh, fields, ID and email. And when you look at this table, you might consider some of the data here as sensitive, right? Like the email. Like, I guess we all agree that we don't want that our user's email leaked. 
if someone doesn't agree, please write me in the chat, but I guess all of you agree that that might be considered as a sensitive data. So when we look uh, at our data pipeline, we probably want to protect it in few different level, levels. The first level is what we call encryption in transit. We would like to make sure that if someone uh, is listening to our network and sniffing our request, he won't be able to understand anything. And thankfully, this, private, this practice is provided by SSL. Like if you use SSL and you send all your requests in HTTPS, then our data is seamlessly encrypted in transit and you actually protect it. So nobody can actually listen to your network and get the request. And all GCP service, or at least PubSub, GCS, and BigQuery support SSL by design. And if you uh, use this platform, the only thing that you uh, should uh, care about is about protecting your application or maybe other services uh, with SSL. So BigQuery at least, protected in, in uh, encrypted in transit by design. So we are protected in this manner by default. We don't need to configure anything. The next level is what we call encryption in trust. Uh, when we speak about encryption in trust, we would like to make sure that if someone succeeds in getting access to the physical hard disk in the server, I mean, go to GCP um, data center and actually extract the hard disk from the, from the server, he won't be able to retrieve any data from them. I mean that the entire file on the hard disk will be encrypted. Also in this case, PubSub, GCS, and BigQuery are seamlessly encrypted in, uh, at rest by design without any additional configuration. If you use it and you get you succeed in getting access to, to the disk somehow, maybe you know it's even might be some security issue like uh, that someone can get access to your to the hard disk from another account or something like this. So you don't need to worry about it. You are protected at rest. And in most cases, those two levels are secured enough. Like we are encrypted at rest, encrypted in transit. And if someone outside from an organization or, or didn't get into the info from the front door, he won't, he won't be able to get the data. But even if we are protected by those two levels, once we have access to the table, I mean, we got in from the uh, front door, uh, the user can see the plain data and use it as he wants. And that actually leads us to the next, uh, uh, next to the last level, which is the application layer encryption. One moment, yeah. to the application layer encryption. We would like the application to encrypt the sensitive data before it's written into PubSub or at least before it's written into BigQuery. Uh, and then we will have an, a, a table that's look, looked as follow. We have the user's table and we see the ID with, as a plain text or plain number, but the email is encrypted. And then if someone succeeds in getting access to this table, he, he, he can't get anything from here, right? But you might say, yes, yeah, sure, but there are some cases that I would like to get the plain email, right? I, li I like to see the, the decrypted email. And for that reason, I wish to have some function like decrypt function that I will be able to select decrypt the email and get the decrypted email. And thanks to AEAD functions, we have this ability. AEAD functions are a list of functions, a uh, list of building functions that supported uh, in BigQuery and mainly give us the capacity to encrypt data and decrypt data on demand on query time, uh, in query time, and also support, supports creating keys in straightforward and very simple way. Let's see how it looks. So we have a function, deterministic decrypt string, this function uh, gets three parameters, key set, which is the encryption key, email, which is the encrypted uh, field, 
and associate the data that we won't cover uh, during this talk because it makes things much more complex. Um, so in this case, BigQuery um, will use the encryption key in order to decrypt the email and returns it decrypted in query time, exactly like we wanted. So we might think that we can go home now and like you know, finish this talk and you know keep going with our life. Like if you have some sense of security, you probably just say to yourself, yes, but that means that anyone in the organization or anyone that needs to decrypt the data um, will have to store the encryption key on his own computer and then like uh, use it when he want to encrypt the data. And that doesn't make sense, right? Because the encryption key is top secret. It's not something that I want to uh, spread around. And for that reason, we, wa we want more to protect it somehow. But before that, let's say that we are okay with this approach. Okay, let's, we are okay with spread the key around and give it to any analyst that want to decrypt the data. So we still have a problem here because this query, once we execute it, it's written to the load. And that means that the encryption key, which is the top secret thing in the, in the company, right? Like it's, it's very sensitive uh, secret is written to the log. And if someone will succeed in getting access to the log, he will be he will will be able to to decrypt the data. And this is that, that doesn't make sense. So we probably want to protect our encryption key somehow. And if we use encryption in order to protect our sensitive data, maybe we can use the same approach in order to protect our encryption key. So how does it look? We have the, the data encryption key. This is the encryption key we had so far, and we call it the deck. And we are going to create a new key, which is, we call it the CAC, the key encryption key. And we will encrypt the deck using the CAC, and we'll get a wrapper. A wrapper is the encrypted deck, and it can only, can only be decrypted using the CAC. So, and the wrapper itself is not sensitive. It's not sensitive because you have to have the cake or access to the cake somehow in order to decrypt it. So you can post it, uh, uh, you can commit it to GitHub, you can spread the wrapper around, that's fine. So you don't need to secure it. It's totally unsensitive. Um, and from the application perspective, this is how it looks. The first thing that the application does is it gets the wrapper, decrypts it using the CAC, and then the application has the deck in the memory. Once the application has the deck in the memory, it can encrypt the data or decrypt the data as it did it before. Uh, but then you might say, yeah, but what about the CAC, right? Like, doesn't it the same problem? Like before that, I was supposed to spread the deck around and now I need to spread the cake around in order that anyone will be able to uh, decrypt the, uh, the wrapper in order to use and decrypt the data. So probably we need some other solution here and we would like to make sure that we won't spread around the key, but we will give it to some other external service that will store it securely. And once we need to decrypt the wrapper, we can ask this or request this external service to decrypt the wrapper for us using the CAC. And this external service will return the deck decrypter to us, and then we will be able to encrypt or decrypt the data. So thanks to Google KMS, Q, uh, uh, key management service, and we have this capacity. So Google KMS supports three main, main functionalities. The first functionality is create key. We can actually create the cake using 
Google KMS, and Google KMS will store it securely. And then the second functionality is encrypting or, or decrypting. So we can encrypt the deck using uh, the cake that we have created in Google KMS or decrypt the wrapper using the same cake that we have created in KMS. What Google KMS doesn't support by design is exporting the key, uh, uh, is exporting the key. And that means that if we create the cake in KMS, we, we will be able to decrypt the wrapper or encrypt the deck, but we won't be able to export the, the cake itself uh, and it will stay secured and unreachable even for the cake creator. So no one can actually export the cake. And here is how the wrapper creation process looks like when we use Google KMS. So we have the deck. We first create a new cake in KMS. We can do it by a few clicks in the UI. The, we, we create the deck as we did before, and then we ask KMS to encrypt the, de the deck using the cake. Google KMS will verify that the user that is doing it has the right permission to do so. And then it will return to the user the wrapper, which is, again, not encrypted because the only, sorry, not sensitive because the only way to decrypt the wrapper is if you have access to the cake. One moment, yeah. And now, once we have the wrapper, this is how the encryption process, uh, the encryption process looks like. The application gets the wrapper and asks KMS to decrypt the wrapper using the URI to the cake. It doesn't hold the cake itself. The cake, the cake itself is stored securely in Google KMS. The application only has the URI to the cake. If the application has the right permission, Google KMS will decrypt the wrapper and will return the deck to the application. And so once the application has the deck, it can encrypt or decrypt the data as it did before. Now, it might look a bit uh, complex, but you will see very soon how it becomes very easy. So let's see some coding. I, I would like to say, uh, you don't need to worry about uh, remember the commands or every, anything like this. Uh, take screenshot. In the end of the talk, I will send you a bar. I will you will see a barcode with a link to a blog post uh, with step-by-step -step instruction where you can just follow and implement it by yourself. So for the moment, make sure you in, you you understand the ideas of how to do it, and then you can just follow it by the blog. Okay. Uh, by the way, if you have any question in the middle, feel free to write to me on the chat. I, I will try to answer during the talk or in the end. So let's uh, see some coding. As we said, the first thing that we should do is to create a CAC in KMS. The easiest way to do it is we by a few clicks in the UI and you have a new CAC created in KMS, or you can do it by the CLI. The first thing that you need to do is to create keyring. Keyring is a group of keys. Once you have keyring, you can create a new key. You can create the cake there that related to this specific keyring. The result of these commands will be a new cake stored securely in Google KMS, and you will have the URI to the cake. All right? Now, once you have the URI to the cake, we can create the wrapper. We are doing it by another AEAD functions which name uh, keys.newwrappedKeyset. This function gets two parameters, the URI to the cake and the uh, type of key that we actually want to create. Google K, uh, sorry, BigQuery will generate a new, K, a new deck, new data encryption key under the hood, as KMS to decrypt the, um, to decrypt the deck using the CAC, Google KMS will verify that the, that the user actually has the right permission to do so. And if the application, and if it does, then um, it will return the wrapper to the user. And as you can see, the user itself never saw the deck. So 
we got a wrapper, the wrapper is not secure, you can take it, you can commit it to GitHub and you can spread this wrapper, uh, this, uh, wrapper around to all the analysts or to anyone in the company that actually need uh, to decrypt data. Now, let's assume for a moment that the data in the table uh, that was encrypted using this deck, okay? We have a table, it's contained and encrypted data uh, that encrypted by this wrapper or by this uh, cake, okay? So now, in order to decrypt the data, we use the same functions, the same function, deterministic decrypt string, but instead of providing the plain, um, the plain encryption key, we will use another AEAD functions, which is key.keychains. These functions get two parameters, the URI to the keg and the wrapper. In process time, only once in query lifetime, not for every email, okay, only once, a BigQuery will ask KMS to decrypt the wrapper using the, the keg. And if the user has the right permission, KMS will return the deck to BigQuery, and then BigQuery will use the deck in order to decrypt the data, and the deck itself will never be returned to the user. So we get the data encrypted. We didn't know what was the deck, and we were able to decrypt the data. Okay, that's amazing, right? Now, I guess you all agree that that's a bit complex, right? I, I, I just want to decrypt an email and every time I want to decrypt a field, I will have to write all this bench of code. And, and you know, like it's also multi-statement, it, it's just not easy enough. So I solved it by creating a, a, a UDF, I call it decrypt, that actually hides all, the, all this functionality. As you can see, it's, it's also hiding inside the URI to the keg, the wrapper, uh, all this functionality. And then you can just do, uh, just execute the query, select decrypt email, just as we wanted, uh, just as we wish for. And that's it, that's cool. Now let's take a moment about, let's talk a moment about permissions. Uh, when we created the keg in KM, when we created the keg, in KMS, we have two different kinds of access role. The first role is what we call encryptor decryptor. If a user is assigned to this role, that means that he can ask KMS to decrypt the wrapper and reveal the plain deck. And this is exactly what we wanted to avoid, right? Okay, so we encrypt the wrapper and now everybody in the company has encryptor decryptor so they can actually encrypt the wrapper and get the plain deck. No, we don't want to do it. The deck itself is sensitive. And for that reason, GCP created something very, very cool, such a, in my opinion, amazing role, uh, which named decryptor via delegation. What does it mean? Decrypt, when a user is assigned to decryptor uh, via delegation, he cannot decrypt the wrapper by himself, but he can delegate the permission to another, to other GCP service, such as BigQuery. And then in BigQuery, we'll, ask, we'll be able to ask KMS to decrypt the wrapper on runtime, use the deck to decrypt the data, and then discard the deck. So the data will be decrypted, but the deck will stay secured and the user will never have access to it. Even if you actually execute a select um, keys.keychain and provides the URI to the cake and the wrapper, the, the deck itself won't, um, won't return to the user. So therefore, all humans should uh, be assigned to decryptor via delegation and no one ever should be assigned to decryptor role. Okay, because if you assign someone to decryptor role, it means that you can actually decrypt the deck and you don't want to give anyone this uh, capacity. Now, I can't stress it enough. The deck was never revealed to any user during the, the process, even when we created the wrapper. Do you understand how significant is that? Any questions so far? Okay, so we spoke a lot about how to decrypt the data, 
but first we should encrypt it somehow, right? And we probably want to do it, sorry, we probably want to do it uh, on the application side before we write the data or loads the data into, uh, into BigQuery. So in order to do so, we can use the Tink library. It's an open source library create, uh, developed by Google that has version in uh, Python and Java that actually uh, give us the ability or the, uh, the ability to, um, to handle with keys very easy and also handle with encryption and encryption very easy. It simplifies simplify everything regarding encryption uh, in Java and, uh, and Python. So let's see how we can encrypt the data using the, all these approaches when we use the Tink library. The first thing we should do is generally decrypt the wrapper, right? So we can use a, a, we can use the object Tink dot keys and handler, which gets two parameters. Surprisingly, the U, the URI to the cake and the wrapper. Tink or the application will ask AMS to decrypt the wrapper using the URI to the cake. And if the application has the right permission, now in this case, it won't be decrypted via delegation. It has to be decrypted because the application is not a, UR, a, a GCP service. So we will talk in a moment about what does it mean regarding security, but let's say that the application has the right permission, the decryptor role, then KMS will return the deck to the application and then we can create a Cypher object. At this moment, we have a Cypher object with the deck in the application memory, and we can use it in order to encrypt the data or decrypt the data as we want. Now we said that the application um, holds the deck in the memory, which means that if an individual will have access to the server, he will be able to retrieve the deck, right? And this is something that we want to avoid from. And therefore, we should restrict access to the server and make sure that any maintenance will apply from outside. You can do it by SCI or by logs, but no one should ever should, uh, should have access to the server. And generally, if someone gets access to the server, it actually means that you need to rotate the deck itself because you, you can consider it as leaked and now your data is less, less secure. Now, as you can see, it's simple. And if you are using script, uh, Tink, you can actually uh, encrypt or decrypt data in few lines of code. Another option to encrypt the data is using uh, AEAD functions, the same like we use deterministic decrypt, then we can use deterministic encrypt and it will encrypt the data. Now, you probably want to use this functionality when you are modeling. Like, for example, if you want to create a model that extracts uh, the username from the email, you will first use deterministic decrypt to decrypt the email, extract the, the username from the email, and then use deterministic encrypt to encrypt the username again. It's less common use case, but you might want to use it in some cases, probably when you are modeling because generally you don't want to load the data and when it's as a plain data to BigQuery and only then encrypt it, right? Like you, you want to make sure that the data when it's stored in BigQuery, it's always uh, encrypted. And that's it. Our data pipeline is now protected on all the three levels, although also on the application layer. So, Let's take a moment to speak about deterministic and non-deterministic encryption. Uh, as you saw, all my uh, examples were about deterministic encryption, but BigQuery supports the equivalent functionality for non-deterministic encryption. What is the difference between those two? When we speak about deterministic encryptions, that, um, um, that means that no matter how many times we will encrypt the same data, for example, the email aa at aa.com with the same key, we will get the same gibberish. While in non-deterministic, we will get different gibberish every time, even for the same email. So the first time we get first gibberish, the second time we get sec the second gibberish. 
Now, when we use deterministic encryption, we can still get some insight about the data, even if we don't encrypt, decrypt it. For example, we can select the count distinct of emails without decrypting the data. Okay, so we look on the encrypted data and we can get insight from it. And on the other end, if we use non-deterministic encryption, you can't infer anything from the data. Now, the decision of what to choose is pretty much depend on the use case, and you will need to think about it and determine the preferred method. Don't think that deterministic is less secure than non-deterministic all the time. Like for example, if you can infer all your, you can, sorry, if you can get all your insights um, from the encrypted data, then you never has the need to, you never have the need to decrypt the data, then it's more secure. But if you, um, you always need to decrypt the data, so you probably want to, uh, use non-deterministic encryption, and there are other reasons why to choose one or another. So it's pretty much depend on the use case. You probably ask yourself what about performance, right? Uh, so I try to figure out what is the efficiency of uh, the decrypt function. Um, so I created a table of 100 million record with 64 uh, random bytes encrypt them, and then run some query that will decrypt them all. Uh, in order to make sure that it's actually scanned all the data and at limit or something like this, I tried two different query, one with the substring and group by, and the second one was um, select distinct. And, sorry, I didn't check it when I disturbed, so. so in order to make sure, I run two different kinds of queries, one with substring and group by, and the second one with select distinct. Uh, and that this is how I'm, I was sure that all the data is actually scanned and all the records are actually got decrypted. And as you can see, the elapsed time, which is the actual query time, meaning the time it took to the query to return, is almost the same. All right, uh, but when you look at slot time uh, that present the amount of resources that the query used, there was an overhead of about 50 to 80%. Now, as you know, BigQuery use more slots in the query uh, if the query is more complex, but it depends on the general load and the ability of the resource. And we cannot actually guarantee that the elapsed time will, be this, will remain the same. Also, if you run more complex query, then your query might be slower. Now, anyhow, in my opinion, decrypting 100 million records in 22 seconds is super fast and impressive, but still, it's a good reason to encrypt only the data that is really sensitive and not encrypt everything, okay? If something is not so sensitive, think about it. You, you probably don't want to encrypt everything, okay? So, also in terms of performance and resources that you will need to use, this is a good reason why not to encrypt everything. What about pricing? Uh, regarding pricing, I want to remind you that keys.keys a chain uh, called only once in processing time. It means not for every email. So we actually um, charge, charge for a single decrypt call, which is nothing compared to the query cost. Uh, KMS charges for 0 0.03 uh, USD per uh, 10,000 decrypt request, so it's insignificant, like, seriously. Like, the, the, the price of KMS here is, like, really insignificant. But what you should be aware of is that each encrypted field has 21 bytes overhead no matter what was the original value is. So firstly, that affects the query cost, but more importantly, the, the uh, story, it affects the storage cost, but more importantly, it affects the query cost. Why? Since BigQuery, as you know, charges, charges us per scan bytes, and now we are scanning more bytes. Like for example, if the average size of the plain field is 10 bytes, and now we have overhead of 21 bytes, then we 
triple our storage, but we also triple our query cost. Uh, so keep it in mind, and this is another reason, another good reason actually, to encrypt only the data that is really sensitive. Okay, last, sorry, last point. Um, before we finish, unfortunately, this mechanism uh, has some limitation when it's come to multi-tenancy. As you remember, the function keys.keys.chain is called only once in query lifetime, which means that we can hold the we can't hold the table with the, like for example with all the wrappers and try to decrypt the data dynamically using different wrapper for each different tenant. Okay, this query won't work because keys.keys a chain has to be called in process in, in like in process time, like in the beginning. It's supposed to be uh, static, not dynamic. So you can still use a function with multi-tenancy, but and decrypt it on the uh, encrypt it on the application side using different wrappers or different deck, but you won't be able to do something like select star, and you will have to decrypt each uh, user on each tenant on um, on BigQuery separately. All right, so keep it in mind, and if you might uh, get into it, then you will need to be uh, more creative regarding how to deal with that. But select start is something that you won't be able to do and if you use different wrappers for different tenants. And we got to the end of the talk. Uh, my main message for you is keep data security in mind. Uh, think about how, think about protecting your sensitive data uh, you already know the principle and you know how BigQuery make it easy to implement. Uh, and if you, if you don't use BigQuery, you have some ideas how to do it in other data platform or other data warehouses. So try to think how you can do it over there. Um, but I also like would like to ask you to do it only when it's actually needed. Okay, don't encrypt, uh, uh, don't encrypt everything. Encrypt just what you actually need to encrypt. Think about the analyst that's using the table. You think about how annoying it, it will be to call the crypt all the time, select the crypt, select the crypt. Uh, it, if you will encrypt everything, then in the end, people will probably start to save the crypted version of the data uh, in some uh, temporary table or in some persistent table. And this is something that you definitely want to avoid. Um, I want to thank you for uh, listening. I hope you enjoyed my talk. Uh, as I promised, you have a barcode here that directs you to a blog that I wrote. It includes step-by-step -step instruction that you can just follow and implement it on your site. You are welcome to follow me on Medium, add me to your LinkedIn network, or reach me uh, or reach out regarding any data problem you have by email. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any, well, uh, any questions? So, um, thank you very yeah. much, Ron. Oh, sorry, please. So, uh, I see that uh, that Atul, I'm, I hope that I pronounce it well, ask wh uh, when to use deterministic to non deterministic. So, it's not, it, it's not, uh, I cannot say that there is such um, such a book that say when you should use one of each other. It depends on the use case. Like, when, you, when we talk about deterministic, it means that you can infer from the encrypted data. So if you believe that most of your questions can be inferred from, uh, can be answered from the encrypted data, then use deterministic. Another reason to do it is like, for example, if you get the encrypted field and you need to search, like for example, for a red code using the encryption field, the encrypted field, then you won't need to decrypt the data and then uh, in order to, to check if, in order to look for this record. So, and from the other side, if you always need to decrypt the data, then you probably want to use non-deterministic because from non-deterministic, you cannot infer anything from the data. Yeah? Like you cannot even do select count distinct. You can only do select count over your data. You can only know how many records you have, nothing beside that. Is that answer to your question? 
Yes, thank you very much. Great. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I have another question. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for your talk. It's very informative. Um, I have a use case because I originally started um, using uh, encryption in BigQuery. And I have a my, my use case, I want to encrypt uh, salaries of a company. And there is a group, there's only a group of people that should have access to see that. But BigQuery admins should not be in that group. How to do that? Can I guarantee that uh, Google Cloud admin cannot get access to the keys? That's a good question. I, I need to think about it for a moment. Um... None of the admin, even not, uh, you mean, uh, no admin should be ever uh, be able to do it, you say? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I know it's difficult. Uh, so, but... so this is my suggestion for you. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it's solved it by 100%, but this is what I can suggest. Uh, maybe you can create the CAC in a different project where the admin doesn't have access. So the admin will be able, for example, to create the cake there, but you, only you will be able to, uh, to use this cake in this different project. And this project will only hold the cake, not, nothing beside that, okay? And then you will um, will have access from the original project to this specific cake. And this access will grant only to the specific user that should be able to decrypt the salary. This is something I can think about. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, there's still always the admin of the organization. So I guess that's so unavoidable. I say that like in this case, the admin of this specific project mm -hmm. has to be someone else, like not the global admin or the regular admin. It's supposed to be someone that has access to, uh, to the deck. Can see the the specific data. This is the only options that I can think about, like uh, how to solve this power user. Like I, I actually never deal with the situation, but like this is the only way I can think about. Okay, thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Ron, thank you very much. It was very interesting. Uh, in the next few days, we are going to give you the link to the video and uh, to the slides uh, on our website. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. It was great.